prepare to pray as we're reading through this book over these next uh, several weeks is the prayer to St. Michael. I think most of us know it, so in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to turn off this microphone. Use my wireless mic instead, because I think there's a little bit of a feedback at this one. This one's a little more ultra-sensitive, so... Well, we're about to do another book study. Last Lent, we did one of the Matthew Kelly books. Which one was it? Do I remember? So the Seven Pillars? Seven Pillars. I, what was it? Oh, Dynamic Catholics. That's what it was. Okay. His Seven Pillars, of course, are found in his other book and also on his uh, CD. You can listen to that as well. I know there's lots of copies of that floating around as well. This book is not written by Matthew Kelly, but it kind of falls into the school of Matthew Kelly, if you want to call it that. Uh, it does come from the same uh, group that Matthew Kelly sponsors called DynamicCatholic.com. You can visit there on your own if you ever want to. There's all sorts of wonderful things there. Matthew Kelly has been doing so many wonderful things to help renew and to revitalize our, our awareness of our Catholic faith as, as well as evangelization, which is going to be a very important, uh, is a very important uh, aspect of our faith mission as well. Um, John R. Wood is the author of the book that we have called Ordinary Lives, Extraordinary Mission. Um, he's an optometrist, means that he's an eye doctor, but uh, as you read the book, he'll, you'll get a little bit about himself as you go through it as well. But uh, certainly it's a, I read this book, oh, I think last fall, and that's where I was sort of inspired, and I said this might be a great book to, uh, to do a book study on during our next Lenten journey. So the books are, everyone's got one, I presume. They cost us $3 each if you wish to leave a donation at the end of today or next week or whenever you may if you don't have to, but I'm just telling you what the books do cost us as well. Okay, so we're about ready to begin. What I'd like to cover today, of course, is the introduction and step one or chapter one, as it's called. If you would, turn to, uh, well, let me start off with this. I'm, I'm going to begin on page nine, sort of highlighting some of the points, a couple of you may have already read some of the book already, those of you who jumped the gun and got the book already. If not, that's okay. You can, it's easy reading. There's nothing horribly technical about it. It doesn't go into deep theological abstract truths that make our heads spin sometimes. It's very common sense and everyday, ordinary, practical advice for us to follow. And he starts off in his introduction um, with a quote before John Paul became Pope. In 1976, he came to this country. This was, remember, he was elected Pope in October of 1978. In 1976, he came to this country because the Eucharistic Congress was held in Philadelphia that year. And so he came as Cardinal Carol Watia. That was who he was known as. Carol, of course, or Charles is his name, you know, before he became John Paul II. And while attending that Eucharistic Congress in 1976, he, uh, he said something. And the quote is right there. We are now standing in the face 
of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think the wide circle of the American society or the wide circle of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the antichrist. This confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It is therefore in God's plan, and it must be a trial which the church must take up and face courageously. Prophetic words, you think back in 1976, and uh, a lot was already happening from the fallout of the 1960s and everything else, but uh, a lot more has happened since then in our culture and in our world as well. And uh, two years later, after he spoke those words, of course, is when he became, was elected Pope. And remember what his, really what his opening words were when he became Pope. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. You know, after reading this, these lines here I just read, one can almost shiver a little bit and be scared. And in a moment, we'll talk a little bit about that fear that so many people have in our world today. But uh, John Wood says in the next paragraph there, he says, the problem is not out there. You know, we oftentimes say that's the problem and there's the problem. You know, when we try to analyze whatever that confronts us in our world today, and we'll say that's the problem. The problem isn't out there. The problem is within. The greatest battle lies within us because it all takes place inside the human heart. We know that in the 1960s we had the Second Vatican Council, a great council of renewal for the church, and only now we're beginning to understand its impact in our lives. You know, in those initial years following the council, there was lots of interpretation, lots of innovation and everything else. But I remember as, as a teenager in high school back in the 70s, and I, I remember doing a paper on Vatican II. And I was in a public school of all places. wasn't even thinking about the priesthood yet. But I remember saying in that paper, who knows what happened to that paper and where it's gone since, but uh, I says, we ha- it'll take us 50 years before we just begin to open up and begin to understand the words of that great council. And we're now finally at the 50 years, aren't we? You know, the first great document that came out of Vatican II, Sacrosanctum Concilium, the document on the liturgy, was 50 years ago. And then all those other beautiful documents that flowed out of that great council as well. So... But one of the overall themes of Vatican II is about change, but change within us. It's not about changing things outside, it's about internal change. The other thing that Vatican II emphasized was a call to holiness. Holiness is a rather abstract word sometimes for us. Matthew Kelly likes to call it instead, he says, the best version of ourself. We're called to become the best versions of ourself, but that's what holiness is. We're all called to be saints. We're all called to be holy, and that is not something that's beyond our reach. That better be our goal, to be a saint. Everybody who's in heaven is a saint, whether they're the recognized named ones or the unnamed ones, the countless unnamed ones that are in heaven as well that sit. But holiness is a choice. It's not something that just automatically happens, and I think sometimes we kind of get that way. You know, that's just the way our human 
nature tends to be. Remember that our human nature is flawed. It still suffers from the effects of original sin. Original sin is removed when we're baptized, but not its effects. Not its effects. And one of those effects of original sin, of course, is we're weak, our intellects are clouded, and uh, we can easily deceive ourselves into believing what is true and reject what is untrue. But we cannot be ourselves the source of truth. God is, Jesus is the truth. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So holiness has to be a conscious choice that we make, and it has to be a conscious choice that we make every day. At the end of chapter 1, there's a little practical thing that we can do. I was tempted to buy them for us. I didn't have the time to do it, though, but we can do it. So, And don't go peeking back there at the back of the book to see what it is. It's an internal war as we move on through page 10, yet we look around and it can be very discouraging. We see lots of empty pews. We see too many of ourselves, and we priests as well, going just through the motions in prayer in our churches. And then there is this overall sense of fear that we're just trying to get by, we're just trying to survive. Yet despite all that, John Wood says that he sees hope, and we can never lose hope, no matter how discouraging things look. There have been many other dark periods that the church and world has gone through. If you're a student of church history, we can see that. And yes, these are scary times in one sense, but the church has weathered through just as bad times before. The grace of God, the Holy Spirit, that always keeps us there. Let us always be mindful that Jesus' promise that the gates of hell shall never prevail against the church. It will never be destroyed. And so, uh, to win the war within, there's a war raging within us. We have, you know, if you're going to win a war... You have to have a battle strategy, and that's sort of what this book is all about. Peter Kreeft, a popular Catholic author of many books, proposes that to win a war, you first of all have to know that you're in a war, know your enemy, know what weapons and what strategies that you need to have to defeat the enemy. And so really this whole book is built on that premise. As you see, there's five points there, and each of our weeks of this book study will cover those five points. And the first step is simply knowing that we are at war. I think there's an awful lot of Christians, Catholics, that are, I don't even have the vaguest idea that we're at a war right now. We've always been. From the very beginning, we've been at war. He opens up chapter 1, Quoting our Lord Jesus, in the evening you say, tomorrow will be fair, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today will, and, well, t- the sky is fair in the evening, t- and t- in the morning, today will be stormy, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to judge the appearance of the sky, but you cannot judge the signs of the time. Jesus is telling us that's one of those effects of original sin that we human beings have as a stumbling block. We're not good at reading the signs of the time. We usually tend to focus on the immediate, the here and the now. You know, our noses are like right here. And we kind of don't see the overall big picture. We miss the signs of the times. But it is obvious that something is wrong whether that be in our nation, in our world, or certainly within our church. And we toss around that word crises an awful lot, you know, the health care crises, the vocations crises, the sex abuse crises, and the list can go on and on and on. 
And then what we do is we tend to focus on the crises, and usually what happens too often is we use Band-Aid approaches to try to fix the crises. The problem is, is that the crises is not what the problem is. It's not the root of the problem, you know? I think later in this chapter, you know, he talks about the economy some years back. Remember when everything came crashing down on us a few years back? And so what did we do to address the crises? We threw money at it. And I'm not saying that that was bad, but all we did was treat the symptoms. It's going to happen again. You know, when you only treat the symptom, the underlying root of the problem is going to come back because we haven't cured what really is what ails us. And that's true over and over again. As a nation and as a church, he goes on to say, we have forgotten our story and have forgotten our mission. If we forget our story and our mission, then we lose our identity. And that's the whole heart of this is that we have an identity crisis. A divided church, as we move on to, through page, into page 12 there, The church is divided. We go through the motions. Too many Christians and Catholics don't have any real relationship with Jesus, and that's really what it's all about. And I think that's why so many Catholics leave the church, is because they don't feel connected. They're disconnected, and and I'm not saying it's the church's fault, first of all. It's partially our fault. But it takes a lot of effort on our part to be connected to Jesus. It's just not going to magically happen by sitting in the pew every Sunday. We have to bring our whole self into the Mass, into the liturgy. And then, of course, everything, our faith life has to flow from that through the rest of the week. And if our faith journey is just... You know, our only conversation with God is just coming to church once a week. What type of relationship is that with our Lord? So, uh, there's all kinds of misunderstandings within the church. He points out how, how too many Catholics don't really have the vaguest understanding of their faith the teachings of our church and why the church teaches everything that, that we embrace. So, misunderstood, you know, whether that be outsiders who are not Catholic. I'm reading another book right now about, uh, um, I can't think of the name of it at the moment, but it's about a conversion to the Catholic faith. It was uh, Scott Hahn. You've probably heard of him. He's a famous uh, writer and his wife, Kimberly, who were very staunch Protestants and hated the Catholic Church. But everything that they hated was built on misunderstanding, misinformation, and you'd be amazed at out there what's so misunderstood about us. And we're not very good at helping to get rid of those misunderstandings because we, we don't understand a lot of it. We understand so little of it. So in the Protestant mind or even the non-Catholic mind, whoever they are, whether they're practicing or not their faith, you know, we, we appear to them as just kind of going through the motions that we lack that faith. And then we turn to our own. You know, we're a church of over one billion people in this world right now. At least in name, we call ourselves Catholic. Usually we're baptized. I'm on top of page 13 there if you're kind of following along. Usually baptized Catholics as infants. How many of us here were baptized as an infant? Raise your hand. So we are known as the cradle Catholics. Okay. But unfortunately in this day and age, and I see it certainly as a pastor, 
the number of baptisms that go through here, infant baptisms, but that might be the last I see of that child, maybe, hopefully, connecting into religious ed for First Communion, but far too many of them, we never see them even after their baptisms. We just never see them again. It's, why are you having your child baptized? I mean, where's the follow-up? Where's the following through? And I sometimes get this, I always try to tell them that because I meet with every couple that's having a, bap, a child baptized. I says, you know, baptism's not going to just magically make us be good and make us go to heaven. It just opens up the possibility of heaven for us. And so, unfortunately, that's as far as too many people are getting these days with their children, and now what's even scarier is that there are countless numbers of young adults who are either married or maybe not married with child. The child isn't even getting baptized anymore. And so that's just as scary as well. So what have we been up to this point in our lives? Are we good rule followers? Did we do this and did we do that because the church said we should do this and do that? And I'm not saying we're supposed to not do those things, but for too many people it became kind of just a superficial legalism. Well, we're not supposed to eat meat on the Fridays of Lent, so I guess I better not do it because the church says so. Why do we not eat meat Friday on eat not eat meat on Fridays of Lent? Why do we fast? Why do we do everything that we do? And too many Catholics can't give an answer. They can't give the answer. They just kind of fall through follow through the motions. The problem is, and as he points out towards the bottom of page 13, that becomes dangerous territory. Because once we want to know why, many people will stop following the rules because they want to be in control of their lives, and then they're led astray if they don't have the truth, the real truth. And that's where the real danger is. The bottom of page 13, he mentions Scott Hahn there and his, his conversion to the faith. He mentions that uh, it's the understanding of the history of our Catholic Church. And most of us Catholics, and I'd have to include myself until I taught high school, don't really have a good working knowledge of the history of the Catholic Church as well, you know, a 2,000-year history. We had the history of the church while I was in the seminary, but you know how that goes. You know, it was uh, hit and miss stuff, and it never really, the big picture never really congealed together while I was in the seminary. It was like sporadic things that we studied, but it, it didn't have a flow, it didn't have a connection, and so it never really left an impression on me. But then I was blessed, reluctantly, with teaching high school. I didn't want to do it. I said, I'll do it just for a few years. I ended up doing it for 12 beautiful years, but one of my favorite courses that I taught was church history, and uh, the reason I fell in love with it is because a teacher has to know his material, so that means the teacher has to learn before the students learn it, and so I always had to make sure I was several pages, if not a few chapters ahead of those students as well. And suddenly it all started coming together. And depending upon which author or text you'd read, each one had a different paradigm or model to follow, but it all kind of synced together really nice. And if you can find a good book that's an interesting book that connects it all together, read it. Learn about your Catholic faith and the history of your church. You'd be amazed at what you'll learn and how it all connects, and it then brings us to the present as to what we are now and why we are right now. So, uh, we all want to become who God wants us to become by embracing that relationship with our Savior. 
and inviting countless others to do the same. That is what a genuine faith should entail, that we want to become, first of all, what God wants us to become, holy, best version of ourself, whatever you want to call it, by embracing a relationship with our Savior, which means we have to have a relationship with Jesus. It has to be more than just a superficial one. It has to be an everyday one. And that's not easy to do. I know in a secular world that we live in, even as a priest, with the multitude of earthly distractions that are there, in themselves maybe not bad, but they take up our time. And once they take up our time, they take us away from God. And really working at a relationship is any of you who are married know that for your marriage to be a good marriage, it takes an awful lot of work, an awful lot of talking and listening and compromising and sacrificing. And really, if we're going to have a relationship with our our ultimate spouse, who is Jesus, who has married us, his church, then we do need to have time for him. We have to be with him, and we need to talk to him and listen to him as well. As it says there towards the bottom of page 14, we need to understand that everything in our faith has a reason. It's like a treasure chest full of truth, established and given to us by Jesus Christ. We're not going to be looking at those truths. That's for other pursuits. But uh, we need to have a game plan, a strategy for living the truth of our Catholic faith in this modern world in the midst of a very divided church. Authentic lives bring unity And despite what the culture of this country tells us on the top of page 15 there, there is real truth, there is absolute truth, and that truth truth is possible to live out in today's world. I think why there's such an uneasiness and why there is so much fear in our world today is because we've abolished the truth. We've bought into what's called relativism, moral relativism, relativism, which simply says there really is no truth, that anybody's truth, if I think it's okay, then it's okay. And that creates chaos, confusion, disunity. Think of how disunified our nation is right now. I fear for our nation, and I pray for it every day. But... uh, Truth is what it's all about, and it's the real truth. That's Jesus Christ. So the real battle that's going on within us is a battle between the real self and the false self. It's only when we start living with the arrogance that we can decide for ourselves what is right and wrong that we get into trouble. When man tries to make himself a god, he is waging war on the one true God. A troubled nation, page 15. Again, we, probably everybody in this country would agree that there's something wrong all over the place. And this is where we get into the Band-Aid approaches to all the, the symptoms, so to speak. He goes on talking about our economy when it took a severe dive. When was that? Back in 2008, I guess that was. We know that a lot of people lost their jobs because of declining businesses. We know that families continue to fall apart. We know that many people lost their homes to foreclosures. Every one of us here probably knows someone that that happened to. And then, of course, we applied the Band-Aid for the quick fix, throwing money around where we felt it was needed, And what happened was the quick fixes then covered up the problems for a while. But as he says, they will return, unfortunately, in larger form if we don't find the root of the problem and eradicate the problem at the root. 
We treat the recent symptoms, but we don't seem to realize the problems didn't start just in the past couple of years. And then, of course, we go now to the root of the problem. It really is a cultural problem. Our culture seems to promote what? Greed and self-centered need. We have become accustomed to getting what we want and more comfortable buying the things we can't afford. We've confused needs with wants. We have bought into the cultural lie that says life is about what we do and what we have. And so we have gone out to get what we want and done what we wanted to do without considering the consequences. The U.S. health care system as well, as we know that's in crises as well. We know that health care costs has continued to escalate as well. Now, while we may have added years onto our life, people are living longer. All you have to do is go to a cemetery and look at lifespans. People who were dying in the 1960s and 1970s were only living into their 60s for the most, a lot of them. But now we know many people now are living well through their 70s. Many are living well into their 80s. More and more are even getting into their 90s, and we've probably got more 100-plus-year-olds running around now than we've ever had. Yes, we're living longer. While we maybe have added years to our life, we haven't necessarily added life to those years. The diseases keep coming, so we keep treating the symptoms, but our health care system can't be fixed until we focus on treating the root of the problem, not just the symptoms. He talks about depression in young people. That's an epidemic that's happening right now. Just in the last 40 years, it's just spiraled out of control. So many of our young kids, and it seems to be they're getting younger every year. Now, obviously, sometimes it is caused by a, a real chemical imbalance in the brain, and that does require medication, sure. But it's not a virus that's causing the massive outbreak of depression in our country. But again, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of a much deeper and underlying problem. A deeper problem is that's causing our children to walk into classrooms and to shoot their teachers and their fellow students and then themselves. It's so sad when we hear that in the news, but it's just happening far too frequently. So again, uh, the crises we are experiencing are not bodily diseases or plummeting stock markets or high taxes or lack of jobs. They're just symptoms. The real crises, again, is an identity crisis. So the root of the problems for our country as well as our church, it's not out there. It's within us. And we're at war. It's internal. It's in the human heart. Our nation is struggling because we're losing this war at the moment. Our church is struggling because we're losing that war at this moment. Our families are struggling because we are losing this war. I'm on the top of page 17 if you're following along. So we look for ways. You know, here's the problem with our human nature again. There's that wonderful effect of original sin. And one of those wonderful little foibles of our human nature is we're always looking for the easy way, the shortcut. And one way we do it is we look for ways to justify our sins and the sins of others. We're very good at being con artists when it comes to that. We look for coping mechanisms for our sins, especially when we make poor choices. 
and we're always making poor choices. That's what sin is all about. And then we try to justify our poor choices as if we're doing the right thing by simply saying that it's not possible to do the right thing or it's maybe just natural for me to do it. Now, me, by saying it's part of our broken human nature, it's one of the effects of original sin, doesn't make it okay. I'm just telling you the fact that that's the way our human nature is. It just simply tells you and myself how much we yearn and need salvation from our Christ, from the cross. But that doesn't make our sinning okay. So, he speaks a little bit about... uh, Communism, which used to be that big thing we feared so many years ago. Socialism as well. Those philosophies or political systems that were forced upon nations were founded on the principle that people cannot choose for themselves. And then what happens was then they have a dictator. And then the dictator rules with a heavy hand. In America, we don't need a dictator to come and enslave us because we have already enslaved ourselves. The United States is the land of the free and the home of the brave, but if we don't start making better choices in our lives, we will soon be the land of the slaves and the home of the cowards. Strong words. God is king, page 17. You know, one of the greatest gifts, you know, we're all made in the image and likeness of God. What does that mean, that we're made in the image and likeness of God? It means that we, we share in God, some of God's attributes. And one of those great attributes, along with our intellect, to be able to think, is free will, choice, Free, our people are free to choose. And yet, we are only truly free in as much as we choose to do the good. That's St. Thomas Aquinas, I think, way back in the 1200s, one of the great minds and thinkers of the church back in the Middle Ages. And Thomas was a genius, and he said it all. It's not easy reading, by the way, but uh, we're only free in as much as we choose to do good. Our church and our nation have no human king. God is our king. Our founding fathers basically said that. One nation under God. It's on our currency, isn't it, to remind us. I'm sure there are some out there who would like to erase that from our currency not out here, out there. Freedom comes from God, but we are, only free, we are only free when we choose to follow God's plan. Once we deviate off God's plan, then we enslave ourselves, and then we actually choose to lose our freedom of choice. We have free will, so we choose our freedom, and we choose our slavery. And there is much to be enslaved in. There always has been. They're called the seven deadly sins. Pride, envy, greed, anger, sloth, gluttony, lust. Easily all those can enslave us. Jesus tells us that the war is within. In the Gospel of St. Mark, the passage is there on page 18. About the middle of it, I'll start reading it. But what comes out of a person That is what defiles. It's not what is on the outside that goes in. It's what's within a person. From within people, from their hearts, come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from within, and they defile. I think he summed it up pretty well there. My mission, to see and understand the war that's going on within us, 
it's vitally important that we understand then our mission. What is a mission? A mission means a goal, a purpose. Maybe that's what we're missing, and that's what we are missing, is we have all kinds of little many missions in our daily lives, a mission to do this, mission to do that, but the overall mission is the salvation of our souls, to get to heaven. That should be our number one mission, and unfortunately, we've got so distracted with all the other things of this world that we've clouded that mission over. The problem is that we have removed this mission from the culture. Remember that the crisis is an identity crisis. It's a crisis of saints. We have stopped telling our young people to strive for perfection, to strive to be a saint, because we don't want them to feel guilty about the times they fall short. Top of page 19, he asks that question, do you have a mission? What is your mission? And these are all important questions that we must answer. What do you really want from your life? He talks about his own mission. I want my children's future. This is John Wood, the writer of the book. I want my children's future to be better than their past. I don't want my children to worship pleasure. I want them to have pleasure in worship. I want to arm my children with the sword of truth so that they have a fighting chance against an enemy that never sleeps. I want to be a better father and husband. I don't want to go through the motions anymore. I want to help awaken the sleeping giant we call the Catholic Church. I don't want to ask what's in it for me or what's the least I can do. A little further down, I want to learn to love as God loves. I want to learn to suffer well and carry the crosses of this life. I don't want to make excuses anymore. I don't want to say I'm too old or too young or don't have enough time or talent or treasure. That's an insult to the one who gave me my time, talent, and treasure. The bottom of page, one, uh, page 19, I want to be free in the truest sense of the word. I don't want to be a slave to food or drink or any other possession of this world. Packer fans, I don't want my favorite sports team to determine what kind of mood I'm in anymore. I know people who are actually outright depressed when the Packers lose and or any of their other favorite teams. It's amazing that has a grip on them. I'm not saying that's evil and wrong, but it's a symptom of something's not right in our lives. I, on the next page, page 20, I want to befriend silence. I want my life to be an action, not a reaction. I want to make a difference. I want to fight the good fight, finish the race. Sounds a little bit like St. Paul there with nothing left to give because I do not want to face death and discover that I have not lived. He says that these are my dreams, but they're also our dreams as well. The details of our individual missions will vary, but the end goal is the same for all of us, to become a saint, the saint that God created us to be. And we need to focus on that mission. St. Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is an excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these these things. Page 22, a clearly defined mission and clearly defined goals turns our lives from reactions into actions. Think about our daily 
lives and routine? Are we reacting to everything that happens in our life, all the ups and downs, all the unexpected surprises, usually not good surprises, that sometimes fall into our laps, hopefully not every day, but every so often, once a week? Do we react or do we act? To become the saints we were created to be, we may need to avoid certain people at certain times as well. Who are the influences in my life as well? And sometimes we need to retreat from those influences. doesn't mean we're unchristian to them. doesn't mean we don't speak to them, but maybe we shouldn't be keeping company with them too much. It's amazing. I observe people a lot. I'm not innocent in any way, shape, or form, but, you know, at home they will never use bad language around their wife, their children, but then as soon as they're with their buddies, all of a sudden, you know, the F word's out there and GD is out there and all the other bad language, you know? Is that maybe the best type of company to be keeping? Is that who you really are? So, and I think he gets into that a little later in the book here as well. He talks about sometimes the dual lives that we live. The dual lives that we live. Depends upon who we're with. We call that, when we're speaking to our teenagers, what? Peer pressure. That applies to us grown-ups as well, doesn't it? Peer pressure. So that could be one of our first steps is to retreat from this world for periods of time. But that doesn't mean that we leave this world because we have a mission in this world. And the mission isn't just for ourselves either, as we'll see down the road here. So discovering, they will follow you at the bottom of page 22. Discovering our mission, we realize that we are not called to abandon the world and run from evil. As Christians, we're never called to do that. Instead, the mission challenges us to live right in the middle of the world. However, when we're living right in the middle of the world, the temptation is always there to focus on changing others and their faults, and that makes us feel better about our own lives, and that becomes judgmental, self-righteousness, and we know that that's not what we're supposed to be either. You know, there's so many different stories about judging others in in the Bible. How can those people do such horrible things? We shouldn't be asking that question, how can those people do such horrible things? Because those stories are really about ourselves. Those stories are supposed to be mirrors for ourselves not about those people, it's about me and what needs to be changed in my life. We have to be able to see the struggles in our own life first. So, as he says there on page 23, the next paragraph down, the reality is to change others, we must first change ourselves. That's really what Lent is all about when you think about it. It's about changing ourselves, and when we can change ourselves it will start causing a ripple effect for others to change as well. When we focus on changing ourselves for the better, it automatically challenges others to change as well. Think about it. If you're in a family, you don't live the most healthy life, you eat the wrong foods, you don't exercise, you spend countless hours on the couch in front of the television set nibbling on potato chips and sugar-laden soda, or even worse, diet soda. That's just as bad for you. Um, And then one day, you yourself say, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to commit myself to 20 minutes of exercise every day. I'm going to start eating at least two healthy meals every day. I'm going to spend only one hour of time watching television each day. And that's a radical change for some people. 
But you don't impose it on everybody else in your house. They're not going to embrace that. But you start doing it yourself. And you start feeling better about yourself. You start finding energy that you'd never had before. And the others are going to notice that. You're not as moody as you used to be. You're happier. You're doing more. You're getting more accomplished. And suddenly they might be inspired to do the same thing because they're going to want to know how to do it. And the same thing works in our faith journey as well. And that's what he's saying right here. This book is about five steps to help ourselves to become a saint. It's not a book about five steps to help you become a nice person or a good person. That's not good enough for God, by the way. And too many of us go by that excuse that I don't really need to change anything in my life because I'm already a good person. I'm already a nice person. Yeah, we already know you're a good person and a nice person, but that's not going to get you into heaven. We need to become saints. The bottom of page 23, pride, our worst enemy, pride. Pride tells us that nothing controls us, that we are free. We pretend vices and addictions don't hurt anything. We become defensive as somebody tries to imply that the things we love in this world prevent us from becoming saints and are holding us captive. John Wood says, I encourage you to seek out your weaknesses no matter how small the world perceives them and crucify them. Next page. It says, your friends and your family may not like this challenge, but when you begin to become who you are meant to be, they will see peace in your eyes for which they will long. They are longing for that. We're all longing for it. The best thing each of us can do for our children and family is to become a saint. Unfortunately, at the bottom of the last paragraph just before excuses, excuses, unfortunately, very few people are striving toward becoming who they're created to be. And on page 24, excuses, excuses, excuses. We all have them, don't we? We're good at it. Many excuses can justify our failures. One is... One excuse we use is that nobody's perfect, which is true. No one here is perfect. It's ingrained in our minds from young on. And so then we exploit it, though, and then we stretch it to use it to our advantage to make up all sorts of excuses, though. How many times have you heard the phrase, you can never be perfect. That is a lie. If you are planning not to go to heaven, then yes, then it's true. But we better become perfect if we're going to go to heaven, because that's what Jesus says. Unless you are perfect, you cannot enter my Father's house. Be perfect as my Father is in heaven. So it's a lie when we say or hear someone say, you can never be perfect. We're supposed to become perfect. We're not perfect right now, that's true, but we're supposed to be in process. Next page, 25. Fortunately, life truly is not about what we do and what we have. That's, that's the stamp that the culture places value on everything around us. What you do and what you have determines success. In the world's eyes, that's what it means to become perfect. I suppose when you become a millionaire and you make it on the top five list of the who's who of the world, right? Or maybe a billionaire is better since millionaire isn't so hard to do anymore. Life is truly not about what we do and what we have, though. Life is about who we become. That's what it's always been about, what we become. And through Him up there on the cross, perfection becomes possible. We're all called to that. He didn't die on our cross. He didn't die on His cross. 
just so our sins could be forgiven or to give us a coping mechanism for our sins, he came to give us the power to overcome sin. That's what that is doing up there. It's giving us the power to overcome sin in our lives. Yes, it makes forgiveness possible, but it also makes us, it gives us the power, not us, but him giving it to us to overcome sin. So be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. We can't sin accidentally, by the way. I think we all know that. It's intentional. It's by choice. And we've also overwhelmingly embraced the mantra, nobody's perfect because it hides our fear. And as I've been saying, we live in fear. Page 26. The power of the cross. We need to, first of all, trust. Trust that God will make himself manifest through our lives. I love St. Paul. He says so many beautiful things. He's so human, and yet he's becoming so perfected when he says, I have the strength for everything. But notice what he says. He qualifies it through him who empowers me. It's not me. It's him. The only way I'm going to get to heaven, not by anything I do, him working through me and helping me do the things I need to do. But I have to let him in. There's where that intimacy and that relationship is so important. Page 27. The top there it says, um, we need to rediscover our mission. We need to take responsibility for the power that we are given. We're afraid of that power because it leaves no room for excuses. Oh, we love excuses, don't we? It slaps us with the cold reality that we have chosen who we've become as a nation, as a church, and as a people. A little further down, he wants us to love as he loves. And one quality of God's love is that it must be free. This is why he will never force us to do anything. A little further down, keeps hitting us in the face. It takes a lifetime to make a saint, practicing it over and over and over again. The Catholic Church teaches that if we don't become fully who we were created to be in this life, then we'll need that final purification before we enter into eternal glory. So he goes a little bit into here to the doctrine of purgatory. C.S. Lewis, I'm sure you've all heard of him, great Christian writer. You could almost say he was Catholic, although I don't think he ever became Catholic, but maybe if he'd lived a little longer, he would have taken the plunge, so to speak. But uh, he's a Protestant, but he's so Catholic in everything. He even embraces purgatory. It makes complete sense to him. As he says there on the, towards the top of page 28, I believe in purgatory. The right view returns magnificently to, uh, I mean, purgatory got kind of distorted back there in the Middle Ages, which of course was one of the sparks that set off the Protestant Reformation. Again, it was misinformation, and misinformation as how it was lived and believed, even by the clergy, never taught officially by the church as doctrine or dogma, but uh, it got perverted. But you've got to go back to the roots of the teaching of what it really is all about. And that's what C.S. Lewis did. As it says there, mind you, the Reformers had good reasons for throwing doubt on the Romish that's us, the Catholic Church, doctrine concerning purgatory as that Romish doctrine had then become. The right view returns magnificently in Newman's dream. Newman was the great convert in England. Perhaps you're aware of him as well. Um, there, if I remember rightly, the saved soul at the very foot of the throne begs to be taken away and cleansed. 
It cannot bear for a moment longer with its darkness to affront that light. Remember, God is light from light, true God from true God, God himself. Religion has claimed purgatory. Our souls demand purgatory, don't they? Would it not break the heart if God said to us, it is true, my son, that your breath smells and your rags drip with mud and slime, but we're charitable here and no one will upbraid you with these things nor draw away from you, enter into the joy. Should we not reply, with submission, sir, and if there's no objection, I'd rather be cleaned up first. It may hurt, you know, even so, sir. Interesting analogies that they're using there. We, it's hard to talk about something like purgatory. Of course, purgation, fire is a common image used in purgatory. Is not so much in a sense of pain, although pain is necessary for growth. We are told that in our Christian lives, and especially with the cross. We don't need to look for it. It's there. We need to embrace it. And Christian, we need to we need to make it holy. I assume that the process of purification will normally involve suffering. The treatment given will be the one required, whether it hurts little or much. Purgatory is about cleansing, page 29. It's a final preparation for heaven. To many ordinary men and women, Many ordinary men and women have lived extraordinary lives. The mission seems far-fetched and difficult, which is perhaps why so many people avoid the journey or why those well-meaning people stop encouraging others to be saints. And here's our problem. We want instant results. Everything our culture's about now is immediate, instant, everything, right? Photography. Photography used to be fun. I used to have to take a picture, and then I had my own little photo lab, and I had photo paper, and I had an enlarger, and I had fixers and chemicals, and it was a long, drawn-out process, but it was, it heightened excitement as to what is this picture going to, how is it going to look? I don't know if anybody does that anymore, do they? I have all the equipment yet, but I can't buy the chemicals anymore. So now it's digital cameras. You can look at it in the thing immediately. So that's just, I'm not saying that's bad, but it's just everything is like that. Everything from instant, well, it's, I gave up coffee, so now I'm drinking tea instead, decaf, which is making me into this. But anyway, um, instant drip coffee and everything else, you know? It's just instant everything. We don't know how to wait anymore, and maybe that's why we're becoming so impatient as a people as well. We want instant results, and our salvation is not going to come instantly either. It takes a lot of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears. Persistence, page 30. With persistence and our eyes fixed on the goal, we will eventually do what we never dreamed we could, and more important, become the person we never knew we could become, a saint. This is our goal. This is our mission, our deeper yes, that gives us the motivation to say no to the many cultural influences, diseases, and lies that threaten this mission. Okay, so here's what I thought I was going to do, but I didn't, but you can do it. Everybody get at home, go to the store if you don't have them, get those little post-it, stick them things, right? Mm -hmm. And write on every one of them, become a saint. That's all you need to do. And then start sticking it everywhere in your house. On your alarm clock, where you get up, that's the first thing you look at in the morning, right? Stick it there. Stick it on the mirror in your bathroom. Stick it on your microwave. Stick it on your coffee maker. Stick it on the dashboard of your car. Stick it in your office, you know, on your desk. Stick it everywhere. Constant reminders. And he tells you that you'd be amazed at how that can affect you. It's one way that we're 
reminding ourselves of what our mission is to become a saint. Any questions or comments? I think that's as far as we'll get today. Next week we'll do chapter 2. So uh, if you haven't read chapter 1 yet, do that and then read chapter 2. And we'll talk all about knowing the enemy. Any comments, questions? Not that I have answers. Good. Maybe you'll have questions next time. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you, everybody.